Thanks, Amy. So I'm a historian. And because of that, my talk is going to be a little bit different today. I'm going to talk about the past and how it relates to the ancestral movement of today. So where should we begin? I'm tempted to begin here with these toddlers posing as bodybuilders, or perhaps here, what the heck is going on here? But instead, I'd like to start by talking about the origins of the ancestral health movement. Now, for most people, the movement begins in 1985 with Boyd Eaton's landmark paper. But I'm going to suggest that we can go back further. We can go back more than 100 years to something that was known as the physical culture movement of the late 19th and early 20th century. So let me define what I mean by physical culture. It was the building of health, strength, and beauty in the human body through proper diet and exercise. And although few remember it today, this movement was widely popular across Europe and the United States. So this is how I'd like to proceed. I'd like to proceed, proceed in three parts. First, talking about the similarities between the two movements, then talking about some of the differences, and then finally trying to pull everything together that discusses uh, both the origins and fundamental motivations behind both movements. So first, the similarities. First and foremost, there was a desire to get back to nature, or to put it another way, the natural way is the best way. And I think this quote really sums it up well, this quote from 1894. It is reasonably certain that man was originally made to live and exercise in the open air, bathe in rivers, and expose his body to the healthful action of the sun without even the protection of clothing. So, hey! <laughs> so, so this brings us to the idea of a mismatch, right? A mismatch between the way humans were quote unquote designed to live and the modern world. So the problem is modern civilization. Specifically the problems of uh, tobacco, alcohol, overconsumption, uh, patent drugs, which were the forerunner, forerunners to prescription drugs, and ill-fitting clothing. Now, it was believed that these problems were leading to degeneration or decline of both individuals and the species as a whole. And here we can clearly see the influence of Darwin's new theory of evolution in this image from 1904. So the goal of this physical culture movement was to create ideal men and women, ideal men and women who were strong and healthy in comparison to the modern Americans of 100, 100 years ago. So uh, on, on the right there of that image, we see this uh, woman squeezed into a corset and high heels. We see the classic skinny fat man. And we see this over-intellectualized child with glasses and a skull that's too big. Perhaps today he'd be holding a, a mobile device as opposed to a book. So again, he, here's this ideal. The physical culture movement was trying to create this ideal by mimicking hunter-gatherers and looking to the past. And if, if people followed that, they would look like Eugene Sandow on the right. This, this picture is from about 1900. So let's pretend for a moment that we want to join this physical culture movement. So what, what are some of the things we would do? Well, first, we would eat natural foods. These things should sound familiar. Eat whole foods, avoid processed foods, drink some raw milk, maybe take some fish oil. Right? The key point here is that for the first time, really, in the modern period, there's a scientific approach to nutrition, as opposed to just eating what religion or tradition or culture dictated. This is an important difference. And it was believed that by eating a more natural diet, we could optimize health and cure disease. So ads like this were very common. We might also want to try some fasting. 24-hour fasting and multi-day fasts were possible. Or we could do some punctuated eating, right? And you could get your own little watch to guide you through the day. All you paleo entrepreneurs, take note. <laughs> Uh, rise early, exercise, first meal at 11, walk in the afternoon, second and last meal at 5, go to bed at 10, and you do the calculation, that's nine solid hours of sleep. We'd also want to take care of our intestinal health. Maybe 
take some probiotics. Yogurt was especially popular 100 years ago. And this is a great image of good bacteria kicking the butt of bad bacteria right, out of your stomach, out of your intestines. We'd want to do some full body strength training. We might try these groovy barbells. <laughs> and don't, don't be mistaken, some of these folks were ripped. We'd also want to do a lot of walking, maybe even some barefoot walking. This poem from 1859 is great. It says, other kinds of exercises are good, but walking's even better. And on, the, and on the right, we see what might be the first minimalist shoes. Right? <laughs> Representatives from Vibrant, Vibrant, take note. Um, there were concerns about unnatural forms of exercise, like cycling, <laughs> leading to deformities. And I think this, in some ways, <laughs> echoes Jamie Scott's talk, talk yesterday. <clears throat> now, we might also want to join one of the new gyms that were springing up. And these gyms look remarkably similar to some of the boxes we see today. So we have rings and bars and free weights, or this cool gym in France, indoor track, bodyweight exercises, even some MMA action in the middle. <laughs> or maybe you're a do-it-yourselfer and you want to build your own home gym. So there's a, a simple model on the left, some adjustable bars, or something more complex on the right. This is 1906. So platform, adjustable squat bar. And then once you got all ripped in your basement, you could try out for the physical culture exhibition, which I think could be called the first CrossFit Games, held in 1905 in Madison Square Garden. There were 17 different events, lots of walking and jumping, uh, sorry, running and jumping. But there were also things like the deadlift, weighted carry, and rope climb. This is a great rare photo from this period. Um, this is the competition arena, Madison Square Garden. And based on the N-shaped structure in the middle, it looks like it was a hell of a rope climb. OK, after the competition, maybe we want to experiment with some cold exposure. So it was widely believed that um, ice baths uh, helped it, um, promote recovery and increase longevity. And in fact, the publisher, Bernard, Bernard McFadden, founded the first polar bear club in the United States in 1903, which is still around today, Coney Island. Um, also, like today, women were very much a part of this movement. So we have the women strength training, there was an emphasis on natural childbirth, breastfeeding, and dress reform. And I think these images are really remarkable. So women with, women with dumbbells, women doing body weight exercises, and women on rings. Even some Olympic lifting. And, chil and children weren't forgot forgotten either. All right, so we have children with dumbbells, uh, children doing some posing there, and then on the right, what might be best described as mobility work. <laughs> All right, and just like today, there was a, a criticism of conventional medicine, so doctors were seen as pill pushers who just treated symptoms, and instead, the physical culturists, culturalists wanted an emphasis on preventative medicine. And we can see this image on, on the right, I think, is really, really great. So the fences represent present preventative medicine. So rather than building fences, we let people fall off the health cliff, and then we rush them to the hospital, rather than uh, taking care of them ahead of time. Uh, so take this drug industry, right? Um, there was also criticism of patent drugs. Again, these are the forerunners to, to uh, prescription drugs today. Um, they came under fire, especially because they were often marketed, sounds familiar, marketed to the lower classes. Okay, this brings me to the physical culture joke of the day. Right? I saw this several times in my research. What does MD stand for? More dollars. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, the physical culture movement was also powered by new media. But the new media of 100 years ago were different. So we have photography, film, 
And this was also the golden age of newspapers and magazines. We can think of William Randolph Hearst here. So I have a short 20 second video clip that I'd like to show from 1900 that, that represents this, this use of new media. Could be right off YouTube. <laughs> Catch that back <laughs> Okay. So um, out of this publishing frenzy came a number of bestsellers. And, and the circulation of, for some of these magazines are really quite incredible. Uh, the Physical Culture magazine was called Physical Culture, um, exceeded half a million monthly, uh, monthly subscribers. It was pretty remarkable in the 1920s. So half a million publication. Uh, and these books which were published 100 years ago are remarkable to the books, uh, paleo books we see today. So let's just look at chapter three and chapter five from this book from 1925. Water, uh, nature's natural solvent, flushing the system, a mistaken idea, right? And five, why the calorie theory is misleading. Calories do not indicate real food values. Wow, I and mean, this could come from one of the presentations today. Um, and like today, there were hundreds of success stories. And I would argue these success stories benefited both, both the submitter and the publisher. We have here a man recovering from tuberculosis, 1909, a small child regaining his health, and of course the classic same pair of pa uh, trousers picture before and after, 1909. These are all from these physical culture magazines. Uh, finally, here, in terms of similarities, there was an emphasis on outdoor exercise and sun exposure. And, and this quote from the middle um, could be pulled right out of the Paleo Solution or Primal Blueprint, right? To, explo to expose the entire body to the direct rays of the sun with all the clothing removed is very conducive to health. This is the best method of, of obtaining an adequate ration of vitamin D. Begin with a short exposure of 10 or 15 minutes and prolong the duration of the sun bath for an additional few minutes each day. I mean, this is sound, kind of sound, rational advice you hear today. Uh, on the left, we have some pretty gnarly trail running. And on the right, um, we see a young girl enjoying nature in the nude, which brings me to the second part of my talk. <laughs> so differences between the physical culture movement and the paleo movement of today. So nudism was popular, right, or what was called naturism. Uh, wearing clothing was seen as a weakness, and um, the first nudist clubs appeared first in Europe and then later in the United States. And I don't have time to go into it today, but I would argue that this also influenced the artistic production at the period. Uh, here we have Matisse on the left and Gauguin on the right. Uh, with the exception of the presentation yesterday morning, there was much more of an emphasis on correct breathing and posture 100 years ago than there, than there is today. And there was a real emphasis on clean air, especially in these rapid industrializing cities in Northern Europe and the Northeast of the United States. So here we have goggles and a nose filter recommended for city living, especially for train travel, which could be quite dirty. Circulation is another difference. So there was, it was thought that brain work, and brain work means sitting behind a desk, led to poor circulation. And this is one of the origins of Swedish, Swedish, Swedish massage, um, and also the idea of, of um, you could rub yourself vigorously after a shower, increase circulation, and also what was called hydropathy. Hydropathy is the application of different amounts of water and different temperatures of water to the body, and that's what we see on the right there. So we don't talk so much about kind of, you know, are we lacking in, in circulation? Another difference or is, is there were some, uh, the food recommendations were not exactly the same as today. So there were many vegetarians who were physical culturalists. Some advocated raw foods and some embraced unadulterated whole wheat bread. And this might be more understandable when we realize that celiac disease 
the connection between gluten and celiacs wasn't made into the 1940s by a Dutch pediatrician. But what I find really amazing is that we're still having the same de debates as 100 years ago, right? So cooked food versus raw food, vegetarianism versus meat eating, and body weight exercises versus pumping iron, all, all the same debates. It was also more of an emphasis on mastication, right? <laughs> on chewing your food. Right? We just heard a presentation on this. Uh, Horace Fletcher popular, popularized this. He wrote a number of books, very, very popular. So popular, in fact, that he was able to buy a villa in Italy right, uh, from, from the books that he sold. And he said, look, you should chew your food until the point where there's no swallowing necessary. And this actually works. At lunch, you should, you should give it a try. If you chew enough, it just slides down your throat. You don't swallow. Great quote here. Nature will castigate those who don't masticate. <laughs> On the other end, there was an emphasis on excreta, right, which means human waste, particularly feces. There was a lot of talk about feces. We don't talk too much about feces today, right? So feces size and smell and consistency. There was a lot of talk about this. This quote, I think, nicely sums this up. Healthy human excreta are no more offensive than moist clay and have no more odor than a hot biscuit. <laughs> And finally, unlike, and finally, unlike the virtual, uh, virtual world of the paleosphere, there were some physical, important physical locations uh, for the physical culture movement. These include uh, Battle Creek, Michigan, Dansville, and right here, Harvard College. Right? So a number of important people related to the physical culture movement, especially Dudley Sargent, who basically created the, mo the modern physical education program for primary and secondary schools in the United States. And he was also the director of Hemingway Gym here at Harvard, which I understand is still around today. Sure is. OK. This brings me to part, um, this is a long quote. I don't have the time to talk about it. But basically, it says you have to be really fit and strong if you're going to sit all day. This is the longest serving president of Harvard. So let me try to wrap things up here. Just a couple slides left. My, my main argument, my main argument is that uh, both movements were a reaction to rapid social, economic, and technological change. So 100 years ago, industrialization produced the physical culture movement. And today, the digital revolution has produced this paleo movement. Both movements seek to return to nature in a stressful and disorienting world. Both give people a sense of autonomy and control. Both provide the satisfaction of exercising one, one's own body, feeling engaged with others, comparing and noting improvement. And finally, to borrow, to borrow a, phase, a phrase from Joseph Campbell, I think both are used to create a sacred place of our own. They give us a kind of set of sacred spiritual practices, and they hold out the promise of a kind of inner awakening. That ends my presentation. Thank you for your attention.